Hi, Caroline. Thank you so much for um, just coming on here tonight and sharing. I feel like, you know, I know a lot of people that have a heart to hear God, but every time I talk to you, you just say like the most profound things and you don't even realize that like what you're saying is like so from God. Um, I feel like you just it's like you just have this intimacy with him that is so incredible. Um, and I just love it. I think that you're great. Sweet. Thank you. So so I'm so just much. excited that, um, you're willing to just talk tonight. You know, there's so much going on with any and everything, the COVID or the Rona and it's like overwhelming TV and radio and social media and like just our lives. So to have something that is encouraging for people, it's just so necessary. So thank you so much for being willing to, to talk. Yes, I appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity. And I'm really excited and humbled by your very sweet, uplifting words as well. So I appreciate oh, thank that. You. Yeah, absolutely. So just for anybody um, who doesn't know about your professional soccer history and you know all the cool stuff can you tell a little bit just about who you are and your background yes absolutely so my name is Caroline Means um, my maiden name was Stanley I grew up in Kansas City Missouri and um, played soccer my entire life played multiple sports but um, sports were a huge part of my life specifically soccer I also grew up a pastor's kid so I was grown up in the church as people like to use that phrase, um, but it wasn't really until I was on my own that I realized what it meant to truly be following Christ um, and to not just use that label of a Christian as a as a crutch or an, an identity or anything like that. <laughs> um, so that's kind of where I grew up, and that uh, soccer journey took me to the University of Missouri for a semester. Um, God did some undoing of me there and then kind of led me out west to Southern California. And that's where I played soccer for three and a half years before I graduated to go play professionally. So I played in the professional league here, which is called the NWSL from 2015 to 2018 and um, just massive lessons uh, all across the board and quite literally everything there, just moving again, being thrust into a new environment, trying to build a new community, um, trying to find your purpose and all of this um, umbrella underneath that pressure of being at your physical peak, your mental peak, and performing on the field every single day. And I learned a lot about myself, good, bad, and different. And really, God has been leading me on such a crazy, beautiful journey through all of this. And I've, I've gotten to... Um, really be humbled by the Lord in different areas and also be really empowered in other areas. And so it's been quite the journey, but um, that's kind of what's led me to here now. I'm married. Um, I married John Means. He is a baseball player in the MLB. He plays for the Orioles. And we actually met in 2015 um, after my rookie season. And so we got to be together in that journey of both playing professional sports and I obviously retired and I actually retired just before his quote unquote peak, his um, big league debut. So just this beautiful intersection of sports and faith has kind of been a constant in my life. And um, now without having sports personally, it has been a very beautiful, um, again, undoing, I think, and then rebuilding this last couple years, I think. Yeah, that's awesome. And I, I like how you said the intersection of sports and faith, because usually when people are highlighted in sports, they're either like super, super into God and amazing Patrick Mahomes, or they are like just so into the sports realm that they are doing a bunch of crazy stuff and who knows what. So when you say the intersection of that, it kind of humanizes them mm -hmm. from being like athletes to like at the cross we're all level yeah. and civilians don't really look at athletes like being level with them in any area mm -hmm. but at the cross I mean 
we all need it. Every definitely. One of us. definitely. And I think that's, um, that definitely plays into the identity of the athlete and you see various athletes. I mean, the intersection of faith and sports, I love that saying intersection, because when I think of an intersection, I think of just, I live out in the middle of nowhere, Kansas, and we have a four-way intersection right there. It's a four-way stop. Everybody has to stop. Everyone has to decide something. And I think that at that intersection of sports and faith, you have to decide, am I going to buy into the hype of these fans I have or buy into humbling myself at the feet of my creator? And I think that's um, something that a lot of athletes struggle with, that intersection of faith and sport of being idolized and also taking that and trying to be humble yourself. You can definitely get lost in your sport. You can lose your identity in your sport and um, you can really lose Christ in that because you're getting fed. And it's, it's something that um, I've really been extremely interested in looking at it from a faith perspective as well as a psychological perspective because there are so many aspects of it that are chemical in our brain that we don't understand and if you could just understand that it's chemical simply it can help you alleviate a lot of those guilty and shameful feelings that you have of liking the attention from being an athlete and liking the validation and um, it just comes down to those dopamine levels. And, you know, when you get 300 mentions after a game, your, your brain synapses are just firing. Like you're just, it's like, it's high. And then when that comes back down to a normal level, you feel very low. And I think that capacity for that high and that, that dopamine hit increases. And so when you're in a normal environment, you feel like you're not at a normal environment you feel you're very low and so that looking for that next fix of affirmation and of dopamine becomes this cyclical journey of really really digging yourself into a space of being unhappy and really not knowing who you are and what you're grounded on and so that's something that i think that god i have seen throughout my life has tried to show me over and over again and I love that he gives us grace to learn lessons over and over again. And there are lessons that we may never perfect because we're not here to be perfect. And he didn't make us capable of being perfect. And I think that that's just part of this beautiful journey. And a part of my testimony is the constant chase of who am I and why am I here? And I think that is such a resting place or a place of anxiety that a lot of us are sitting in. And that's magnified right now because we're being stripped of so much. Oh, yeah. And you said something that I feel like is just such a perfect transition into where we are right now. Mm -hmm. You said sometimes it leaves you looking for the next fix. And when we talked earlier, you had talked about how we get so addicted mm -hmm. to sin or like addicted to feeding our flesh can you talk more about that? Yes, absolutely. I think that, um, so we were talking earlier and I was talking about how I kind of, I've something that's really grounded me through this is just getting outside and walking, even if it's cold, like it was today. And I was listening and I was kind of meditating on this evening. And I think that sometimes I am subconsciously praying. And I think why I use that phrase is because God can read our thoughts and so you don't have to always outwardly be praying or even be like in my mind thinking like, dear Lord, today I, I think that you're having a conversation with him. And so I was having this conversation and an addict came to mind. And, and as I was walking, I was like, that's a very sharp word, addict. And I was like addicted and just kind of walking. And I was like, what is this? And then just addicted to sin came to my mind. And I was like, what does that mean? Addicted to sin? What is sin? And because you, you know, you could ask a four-year-old what sin, and they might say lying to mommy and daddy, yeah. or you might get murder. And it's like, oh, okay, well, I'm not addicted to either of those things, but what it comes down to sin is it's us. It's our flesh. We were created in God's image, but we faltered and we've become sinful. 
Now, the thing that's so beautiful about that is our sins were paid for, but we still live in imperfect, in imperfection every day. And like we were discussing, that addiction to our flesh becomes, I'm addicted to feeding my flesh. And especially right now, we're seeing, okay, what have I been addicted to? Am I addicted to, you know, getting a $6 coffee, even though I really should be saving that money because I'm not making enough to spend $6, but all the girls at my yoga studio always go there and I really want to fit in and I don't want to, you know, it can be that. We've also on the news, they were talking about the statistics of, of porn usage right now, of video game usage right now. Those two things have just skyrocketed and those companies and corporations are making so much money off of us feeding our flesh. And I like to think of it also as um, people who crave sugar, you eat sugar, it spikes your cortisol, it spikes your um, adrenals, and you're like, oh, that's good. That's good. And then like, you know, 30 minutes to an hour later, you're down. Ugh. okay. Mm, I want something sweet. It's a cycle of feeding, feeling good, realizing this ain't it and going back to it. And that is our life on earth because we are in a fallen world right now. Unfortunately, the good news is this isn't it. And right. while we're here, we can recognize those cycles of just trying to survive on our own and break those cycles and open our hands and understand, I have to let go of these vices. I have to let go of these things, these afflictions, these, um, these traumas, these addictions, and accept that the only thing that will feed my soul is Jesus. And I think that's something that we lose sight of when we're in a storm and we had been talking about weathering the storm. And right now we're in a collective worldwide storm on top of whatever storms are going on in your home, in your families, in your own heart, in your mind. I mean, we've, we've got people who are quarantined right now and they may be quarantined with their own um, worst nightmares, you know, for somebody who has an eating disorder, having a pantry full of food, and being home could be a worse nightmare situation. You could have people who are in an unsafe home environment and they are literally stuck with their abuser. They're stuck and it's all, it's, it's, we're all dealing with this collective storm and collective grief. And it's very difficult in that to trust something that we can't see. Um, a story that comes to mind and I've, and I've written this before, just it, it's been so impressed on my heart about the last month or two is in Matthew 14, 22, when um, Jesus has gone to the mountaintop to pray and to be alone after being with some of the disciples, some of the disciples go out on the boat and at about, and uh, it's interpreted as around three to four in the morning, which is kind of an eerie time anyway, a great storm came upon their boat and they were fearful and they're in this mega storm. And I think it's funny, we hear a lot of us who have grown up in the church hear these stories at such a young age. And so we have a very um, cute watered down version idea in relation to some of these biblical stories. And it's really hard to transition those metaphors into today's life. And right. so, this is a, a beautiful way right now, this pandemic of a storm. We're in a worldwide storm. We are all fearful. We're searching for someone to take control and to give us comfort. And um, so I love this story because Peter sees Jesus out on the water and he calls to him and, and Christ calls him out onto the water. And Peter starts walking on the water as Christ is as well. And he looks down and immediately he starts to sink. And he cries out to the Lord. And what I love it says is it said in um, verse 31, Jesus didn't hesitate. And the next one, it says he was quick to comfort, but he does not let Peter drown. And he asks him like, why did you doubt? And that is in itself enough to make your jaw drop. 
But mm-hmm. something I really thought about was this was someone who lived in relation, in physical, everyday relation with our Savior. They ate together, they napped together, they prayed together, they walked together. And he saw him in one of his most fearful moments and still doubted. And so we, car- we carry that now. You know, a lot of people say, I have to see it to believe it. My, my response back to that is bull crap. If you saw it, you would still not believe it. Right. Because that is how we are genetically made up. We are human flesh. We are of a fallen world. And, and something, another phrase that came to my mind, I was thinking like, like, where is God? Where, where is this? And then I was thinking like, where in the hell is God? And then I was like, where in this hell is God? And the answer is he's here. He is with us. And, and I love that he, you know, he, our humanness cannot be avoided just as Peter's humanness could not be avoided in that moment. He was so fearful of the storm around him that he could not just fixate his eyes on Jesus, even though he was yards in front of him. And so I think that it's something that we're all in this storm and we are slowly but surely being stripped of our vices, whatever that may be, because we are in isolation. And it's a beautiful time to find true peace and true hope in the Lord because we are finally quiet. You know, we're, we're quieting the noise of being in an office every day. We're quieting the noise of going to a gym every day, of comparing ourselves to people every day. We even talked about social media, like, I know you're not in Bora Bora right now on vacation for the <laughs> second time this year. I know you're isolated in, you know, the middle of Missouri. So we, we are losing that comparison and that everybody else is, is you know, gra- their grass is greener. And we're faced with a collective um, grief. And I think this is a beautiful time for Christ to not just intervene with us, but for us to accept that we are all one in the same and we are no better than another. And this is a beautiful time to extend love and grace to people just as the Lord has called us to. I mean, he says above all else, love. Love will never fail us. Love conquers all. I mean, he, he talks about love so much. He, the, God even describes Jesus as love. And so love is what rescued us. Love is what sacrificed itself to show us what real love is. And so that's something that's just kind of been on my heart and and people are thinking, okay, well, if I strip myself of all these vices, like what do I have left? And my, my challenge is go find out, go walk in the wilderness and wander around aimlessly without all your vices and devices and just open yourself to receiving whatever it is that the Lord may have for you. And I think that um, advancing technology is amazing. I think that's the world we live in, but I also think that we're drowning out the simplicity of life that Christ has designed for us. And I think that um, something we had talked about in Psalm 34, it says the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. And my pastor, Jonathan Foster had said something in response to an email of mine a couple weeks ago. At the end of his email, he said, um, Jesus is close in our woundedness, probably because Jesus was so close with woundedness. And if we think of the person who has experienced the greatest loss, it would be Jesus literally losing his life for all of us. But what's so beautiful about that loss is it developed into the most beautiful resurrection promise and um, place for us to spend the rest of our life after this hell. And so it's all about weathering the storms of life until we get to that place. And I think that um, if we can really meditate on that, then another verse that comes to mind, like who can be against us? What can be against us? You know, if you really rest in my, in like the core 
things that the Lord is calling us to do. And it is also different for everyone else because everyone has different um, gifts and abilities. And I think that if God gave us all one in, in the same purpose, then he wouldn't need all of us. Everyone has a unique purpose. And that's why we have to fix our eyes on Jesus, not on others. He doesn't want us to compare ourselves with our brothers and sisters who are also on mission for him just in different ways. And I think that it's been this beautiful reconciliation with who I am in this moment and how am I weathering this storm and how am I allowing myself to step off the boat into the storm and know like with full assurance that Christ is going to meet me in the storm and he's going to calm it. And I think that, you know, we get so caught up in our daily lives and that's okay. We have things to do, people to love, places to go, jobs to accomplish. But there is a way to live your life with a peace in your heart and a joy in your spirit. And that is only through Jesus. And that is not to discredit modern medicine. I'm not here to say we can just pray COVID away. Although we can, because that is my ability right now. All I can do for this is pray and stay home and follow precautions. But God has equipped other people with the minds to find a vaccination. He's equipped the hands of doctors to meticulously work on the patients. And he has equipped all of us to do so for his glory. And I think that that comparison game, it separates us from falling in line with our calling so often. And it has been so refreshing to be away and to reset and recharge in ways that I'm personally uncomfortable with because I get very energized from being with people. And right now I'm seeing my husband and we're seeing his family right now because his dad is very, is very ill. And that's our life right now. We have layers of grief. And I think that if we can take a step back and understand that quite literally everyone is grieving right now, even if they don't understand or recognize they're grieving, they are. Because like we said, the world we knew it before the pandemic is it, gone. The world after the pandemic will be much different. And whether that's we don't handshake in our culture anymore, which sounds so silly, or maybe all of a sudden it's reusable bags only at the grocery store. I mean, we paralleled it with, and it's, and it's, I'm not, I'm also definitely not saying that this is a terrorist attack, but 9-11, we talked about, you know, remember the airports before 9-11? It was a circus. I mean, you could steel toe boots, walking in, shoes, gun on your hip, I'm sure down in Texas somewhere. And, and then life after 9-11 was so different, but we don't even remember it. And I think sometimes God takes that pain and he heals us and we don't even realize he's healed us of something. And it's just a distant memory. And I think that while we're in it though, that is the time to just be where your feet are and stay present with the Lord and what he's calling you to do. Because I think that he's going to be whispering and, and just commanding us to do and be. And um, a beautiful example of that is one of my best friends, Katie, she is a school teacher in independent school district and she's just been heartbroken over not being able to say goodbye to her students and finish the school year. And she works harder than, I mean, anyone I know. And we are having a very difficult time in our family right now. And she texted me that she was driving to my house and she had made dinner, brownies, um, you know, cute notes, Easter baskets, and like set it down and um, on our porch and was like, I sanitized it and everything. And, and she asked, God has put this on my heart. Please don't retaliate in, because you feel you have to. God has truly called me to be a positive, joyful force and to serve you right now. And I think that we get uncomfortable with feelings sometimes because being vulnerable requires us to love ourselves and to love another. And love is very, very, very vulnerable and difficult. And so to let her just love me and not do something back was difficult. But yeah. God, 
God talked to her. And who am I to intervene with that? And it blessed us immensely. And so I think that um, we're seeing Jesus breathe life back into certain things right now. He's breathing life back into relationships and into families and into some businesses and into um, people's just hearts. And I think that the more we let him breathe into us, the easier we'll breathe when this is over, when we go back into the world and however it may look. And I know that's, you know, extremely, extremely long winded, but um, I just love that he never hesitates and he's quick to comfort. And just knowing that in itself is overwhelming um, enough. Oh yeah. End. Yeah. And I always think about how Jesus, like it, it wasn't someone else. Jesus said, it's better for you that I go mm. because if I don't go, the comforter won't come to you. Yeah. If I do go, I will send him. And he was talking about the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit is our helper, our advocate, our standby, our intercessor, our comforter. Mm. He's all of these things to us. And we forget that he's all of these things to us and he lives within us. Mm. Yeah. That God will give you a new spirit. He will place a new spirit within you. Mm -hmm. He will replace your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, something that can feel. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we think that you said we get uncomfortable with emotions. If people are cynical or they're sarcastic about something good or loving, that is like the biggest red flag, obvious, Hey, I have unhealed hurt. Mm -hmm. Hey, I have un unhealed hurt over here. Yes. And they just create this wall around their heart so that they can't feel because they think that it's a defense mechanism and this will keep me safe. But if I don't feel anything, I'll, I'll be better. But God's like, I didn't call you to that. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't give you this incredible gift to live within you for you to try to, to shut him out and suppress the mm -hmm. Holy spirit. Like what kind of a limited, yes, distracted, condensed, watered down life would that be mm -hmm. to not tap into this incredible gift that literally lives within us. Mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of times people don't really talk about the Holy spirit as much. Yes. Um, it's kind of like God, the father, Jesus, the son, Holy spirit's just like, yeah, he's just there tag along, yes. but it's like, no, Jesus is in heaven right now at the right hand of the father. Hmm. He's chilling. Like he did his part and he sent us the Holy spirit. And we're just like, Oh, like I'm good. I'm going to, Hey Jesus. And Jesus is like, will you tap into this incredible, like the spirit of God that I gave you? Hmm. Yes. Tap into that. They're so uncomfortable with the idea of a spirit though. Right. And it's so interesting to talk to Christians from other cultures. I had a friend from Costa Rica and I remember her talking about spirits and I, I freaked out and I was like, spirits, because in my Baptist childhood, it was like witchcraft and wizardry. And, right. it <laughs> and so like spirit was like, it doesn't sit we're right. not comfortable with that. We haven't tapped into that. We're also very legalistic and religious. Spirit doesn't sound like it fits in our box of what we feel right. comfortable with giving you your six bullet points every Sunday and sending you off. So we're going to just toss it in the other pile. Yeah. You know, we're going to just tap into that. Maybe never. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, Maybe and, never. And Along spirit, with, you know, <laughs> sex and all yeah, the other yeah, things okay. that, you know, don't happen. A hundred percent. Right. A hundred percent. And, um, I think that, uh, in Romans eight thirty eight it says neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, Jesus, our Lord. And that is all of it. And if you, what you're saying the spirit is alive and he's here and he's within us and he's around us. And the spirit is, is always 
there to comfort and to heal and is quick to restore. And I think that um, right now we're so uncomfortable with talking about something that we can't, we definitely can't see because in our minds, we can see Jesus and we can see what we think. Right. God. Like, because you see illustrations as a child. So you develop what you think he would look like. And my favorite thing to tell, you know, <laughs> white people or people that, that don't want to say that they have any prejudice or racism in them at all is that, you know, Jesus was a person of color. He was not a blue. He wasn't a blonde, blue-eyed dude. Yes, that he was. In pictures. No. And so here you are labeling yourself as certain things and putting yourself in a box of what you are and who you are and who you are against, but claiming the name of the one whose life mission and still is, is to bring us all together. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess, not just white people's. Right. Like, what? It's, mm -hmm. it's earth shattering. Yeah. And I think that I, I've had to learn that too, growing up in Missouri and then being shipped out to the West Coast and truly experiencing diversity for the first time and, yeah. and adversity with people challenging my faith because where I grew up, almost everyone went to church. And when my faith was challenged, and I retaliated, I realized my retaliation was through my own insecurity and not being truly anchored in Christ. Yeah. And I think that this is the time for us to really sit and, and understand who we are and then make a way for where we wanna go. And that way is right there. It's all in the Bible. There's, there's love letters in the Bible. There's directions. There's, I mean, metaphors galore. You can't even yeah. believe it. And people just separate what's in the Bible so much from relationship with Christ. And I'm pro relationship with Christ. I'm pro spirit. I'm pro being spiritual. I'm pro being so spiritual that it freaks people out because they're like, I've never seen anything like this. Okay, well that tells me that I can't be spiritual on my own volition. I'm not magic. Right. I'm spiritual if I'm speaking out and it sounds like it's not me or it's from something else or we feel a power and energy in the room, it's probably Christ because we've read what he did in the Bible. He gave people the power to part a sea and you don't think that he can intervene in your life right here you don't right. think he can interview, intervene with you? And I think that um, this is going to force a lot of religious people to really lay down and, and lay down by still waters and just be a Luke and just be in wonder and work less and judge less and sit in that love and grace and mercy because you know, I think that in Christian culture, in our country specifically, we have like tied this pretty bow on what it means to be a Christian. And then we've sold this and people are buying it and they're still buying it and they're buying it all the time. And I grew up buying that good versus bad. Like I need to be a good girl. And that's, and that's not even just my parents' fault for, right. for validating that. Like be a good girl, do this. Good girls don't do that. that oh, that's a bad girl. We grow up with good versus bad. It's a no wonder we try to, to compare each other's sin and say, well, at least I didn't do that. Right. Like, this is okay because I didn't do that. And judgment demands punishment. And when you are judging somebody else's actions, what you're doing is you're either psychologically poisoning yourself and your own spirit and your own heart that God wants to keep white as snow, or you're punishing somebody else. And I don't see anywhere in the Bible that we are commanded to go out and punish somebody. Right. I've seen that nowhere. We are not called to punish. And I think that that's something that I really hope that the culture and Christians and churches and religious leaders will break down and sit in that uncomfortableness of the spirit 
and allow themselves to be broken open and really accept that light instead of building up bricks against it because this is comfortable. It's comfortable that there's no LGBTQ plus in my church. It's comfortable that there are no single moms. It's comfortable that there's no pregnant teens. It's comfortable that there's no people of color. I'm comfortable shaking the same hands every day saying, how are you? And not, not being prepared to deal with what the answer is back to that. We've created a divisive culture when the mission is to bring everyone together. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is a time for reckoning. And I think God is going to come in and he's going to wreck some lives in the best way. And he's going to restore families and he's going to restore hope. And I'm praying he restores our government because they lead our human world. And I am praying so much that I can, once I leave, my body uh, stays and my spirit leaves this human world that I get to go experience, you know, the land of milk and honey because this makes me appreciate wanting to get there so much more. And I think that we can invite people into that. And um, someone asked me, uh, I think this is hilarious. Someone asked me, if you die and nothing happens and all of this was for nothing, what do you think you'd think? And my first response was, well, I'd be dead, so it doesn't matter. And my second response was, but it was worth it. But I also, playing into their game because I fully don't right. believe that. But I'm like, it would be worth it because what did I build my life around? Hope, love, mercy, being kind to people, weeping with those who weep, rejoicing with those who are rejoicing. Um, Giving what did that. I lose? <laughs> yes. Nothing. Nothing. Gained everything. I, absolutely. And I almost think if we presented the gospel like that to people, that we would be doing way more good than we are. And I think that we need more religious leaders to step up into that and be prepared for the backlash of their people because that's exactly what Christ did. He received so much backlash from the religious people to go save the woman at the well, to go bring the woman out of the brothels, to, to give, you know, God gave a literal teen, the savior of the world when she was a virgin. And can you imagine? I mean, even that, st that story alone, the inception of Christ is, we would judge that girl, even oh, if she yeah. was in our church pew. And even if we went up to her and said we were praying for her in her single teen pregnancy, I hope it works out for the best. Get in the car. Can you believe? I wonder which boy it was. I bet it was that Johnson's boy. He looked really guilty at church and the mom looked like she hadn't slept. We do this. Why? And I'm just waiting for the hierarchy to just crumble. And I know it will. And I know God is working. And we're, he is weathering the storm for us. We can't weather it on our own. And I think that is the beautiful life raft to jump into is that we don't have to swim through it. We can literally just rest and, and God will take care of it. Oh yeah. And that's what's so much of what you just said is so spot on for even where we are right now. This entire experience of being quarantined at home with families and kids and it is shaking some stuff up. Oh, yes. And I think about all the people who maybe felt like they had a, like a pretty good grip on life. Mm -hmm. And now they're like, what? Yeah. They were really good at being a Christian mm. when their life was good. Yeah. And now it's like, oh my gosh, my kids are crazy. Oh my gosh, I have to do everything online and I'm not really used to that. Oh my God, there's so much that is challenging us in areas that nothing else really could. Mm. We're away from so many people that we're used to seeing, all the distractions that have been able to fill our lives. 
mm -hmm. aren't getting to do that right now. Yeah. And how we come out of this on the other side is so reflective of what we spent this time doing. Mm -hmm. Are you spending it finding out who your authentic identity really is? Who's that person that you've been running from? Because mm -hmm. you don't know if you're going to like her. Yeah. You're going to love her. But if you're not willing to sort through all of these things that are blocking you from her, mm. you're not going to let yourself meet her. Yes. Now is such a great opportunity to give yourself permission to heal the things that need to heal mm -hmm. and go deep, trusting that God is who he says he is. Yeah. Trusting that you are who God says you are. Mm. Choose to agree with him. Like, yeah. all right, God, I don't need to really get all the answers, but I'm going to take a chance that maybe, maybe this Bible is telling me the truth. Mm. If it was, and this book is telling me all of the blessings that come from aligning with who you're calling me to be and all the lives that can be changed and the examples that it gives you mm. of all these people who align themselves with Christ and then thousands of other people's lives are changed. Yeah. The miracles that take place when people are willing to step out in faith. Mm. And now we get this opportunity and it's like, okay, what are you going to do with it? This is an incredible opportunity. There's a lot of people that are scared and that is, fear is a, I hate to say fear is valid because fear is no, never, it, you can argue that, but at the same time, it's like, there's, that makes sense why mm -hmm. people are scared. There's a lot of people dying right now. They, like there's a lot going on. But what better time to give them hope? Yes. To let them know that like coronavirus doesn't get the last say. Mm -hmm. Even if you die from it, it does not get the last say because that's not the end of your journey. It might be the end of this physical yes. journey, but that is not the end of the road. Like, mm -hmm. It's just such an incredible opportunity and now more than anything, it's like trusting that we need to fill ourselves up with the word so mm -hmm. that when we come out of this on the other side and we do get to see people face to face, there's something different. Yeah. That we're not the same people coming out that went into this quarantine. Mm -hmm. We're stronger. We're wiser. We're more secure in our authentic identity. Mm -hmm. Like there's so much power in being who God actually called us to be. And I think more than anything, what I've seen at least from my circle, this has shaken up who people thought they were. Mm -hmm. And they are losing all the little, like you said, it's great to have that high of, you know, people cheering for you and looking up to you and getting 300 mentions after a game people are losing all these voices of validation mm -hmm. that really ultimately don't get to validate you anyway, because it's not your authentic identity. They're mm -hmm. validating all these other things. What are we going to be when we come out of this? Mm -hmm. What will we have shaken off? What is getting pruned off of us right now? Or are we even allowing that to happen? Mm -hmm. Are we cooped up with, thinking about, well, what if this, what if that, what if it's just such a great opportunity for growth and healing. Mm -hmm. We can start being restored now. Yes. Amen. You definitely said it. And I think that, um, I love that you said pruned because I had just listened to Beth Moore talking about, um, chasing vines and she has a new book that's out and she, her podcast, she gives a beautiful reading from the story that I wouldn't spoil, but it has definitely given me insight of every person that I meet, I'm answering questions in their mind. And if I'm meeting and, and acting with somebody, um, I guess, let me rewind. So I think what we're going to see when we come out of this is our faith 
in our belief is not what we do in terms of works, but it's our actions because our actions are a reflection of what's in our heart. And so if I am rude to a stranger, what's in my heart is I don't have the full weight of my interaction with this person, this person is going to live eternity in one of two places. And my interaction with them should be that of, of love and of mercy and of the fruits of the spirit to live out what I believe. And whether that's just a smile on the sidewalk and, and I'm also not going to, um, I'm, I'm, I wanna be sensitive to Sometimes you just have a terrible day. I mean, I, I remember the day we found out that my father-in-law was sick and that was my worst day. And that shifted my perspective in a way this last year of, you don't know if you're encountering somebody who is having their worst day. And that person may be questioning life. Oh, and yeah. if their life is even worth living. And, or, or on a less um, intense level, they just may be like, man, if somebody just was nice to me, maybe that would restore my faith in X, Y, Z. And, and I know that's, that's, that situation is not to guilt people or to shame people, but it's, it's meant to connect us with, um, we've all experienced a loss of some sort in our life or going through an extended period of loss right now. And what is so natural for us to do is to size up loss. And oftentimes we'll size it up in a way of like, um, wow, okay, they lost their dog. That sucks, but like, it's a dog. I lost my mom. Right. Or, you know, they have no idea what I'm feeling. The greatest loss is your own, period. And we also take that in another way, which I feel like most Christians do, is we size that loss up and say, what's the meaning of this? And we just want to find the meaning of the loss because we want to pull vault ourselves out of that icky space of actually feeling it and say, oh, everything happens for a reason. Uh, God, God did this. No, no, no. God did not take your child away from you. That, he doesn't have a reason for that but he's going to bring reason out of that horrible thing. And I love that because we as a family are sitting in that right now. Um, and something that this amazing grief counselor uh, that I listened to on a podcast said was, if you can't feel it, you can't heal it. And so this is a beautiful time for all of us to sit in the storm and to feel it. So that when the storm is over, and the sun is shining and the birds are singing and the, and the sky is beautiful and open that we are healed and then we can go forward. And I think that's what God is calling us to do right now is to heal and to grow so that when this is over, we are going out there and bettering the kingdom and living, as you said, our authentic selves and the way we were made. We were made in his image, but we are of a fallen, a fallen world but made in his image means that there is goodness in all of us and that we are to live that and tap into that goodness and find it. And so that light may shine and that light will be infectious. And I know that word is sensitive right now, but just as bad things are infectious, so is love and light. And the more love and light we can live out, we can infect the world to where the darkness gets a smaller platform. And we already know that the darkness will never win. So who shall be afraid? You know, we can just attack it and understand that the light is always going to make a way and he's always going to win at the end of the day. And it is the most powerful force around us and within us. And that is something that has alleviated so much fear and anxiety in my own heart through all of this, for sure. That's awesome. I love hearing you talk about your faith. It's like you just say things in such a, you simplify complicated ideas and just make it so easy to understand and to really 
let it sink in. And it, it just makes me so glad that we did this too, not only for it being this time, mm-hmm. but just because I think that's such a rare gift mm-hmm. to be able to take things and then say it in a way that people can really absorb it. It's like just such a pure, uh, like when you drink like perfect temperature water, you know what I mean? That's <laughs> like, oh, this is really feeding me right now. Definitely. That's how I feel you talk. <laughs> well, you're so kind. Thank so you. thank you so much. I of so course. Yes. Um, I just love it. I'm going to pray for us. Yeah. Shut it down. That would be great. Thank you for the opportunity as well. Absolutely. Father God in heaven, I just thank you so much for this opportunity, Lord God. I thank you for Caroline, just having the willing heart that she does and just her passion for you, Lord God, her excitement about your word, Lord God, and just the faith that she trusts you with. There's so much going on in this world and in each of our lives. And yet, you are so close to us. I just ask that anybody under the sound of my voice, whether it's tonight or 10 years from now, Lord God, whoever see in this video, that you'll just reassure them that you are right there with them, that you have never stopped pursuing them, no matter how crooked their journey was, Lord God. And that you are, you always have been, and you will continue to be the God who can turn all things around for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. I just ask Lord God for salvation for people, for countries, Lord God, for just everybody who is so thirsty for your word, Lord God that they'll find it and they will accept Jesus, Lord God, that they will be saved. They'll receive salvation and whatever role we can play along the way, whatever seeds we can plant, Lord God, I just ask for those opportunities and we just accept the call, Lord God. We love you. And we thank you for allowing us to do this. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, you have a wonderful rest of your night. You as well. And tell your sweet family hello. I will. I absolutely will. All right. Talk to you later. Thank you. Of course. Bye-bye. Bye.